welcome everyone to the Ward 6 NPA October meeting. My name's Michelle Moraz. I'm on the steering committee for the NPA. I'm joined by fellow steering committee members Nelson Martell and Matt Grady. Um, to start our meeting, we will hold a public forum. This is an opportunity for folks who would like to bring up any topic that's important to them on their minds at this point. So if you have a uh, public comment topic, feel free to chime in now. Okay, I don't see any any hands? Um, okay, so what we're going to do is just dive into our first agenda item, and that is our panel discussion about the size and the role of the Burlington Police Department. And our panelists for this conversation are Ward 6 Councilor Karen Paul, South District City Councilor Joan Shannon, Officer Oren Byrne, who is Vice President of the Burlington Police Officers Association, Lieutenant Mai Wynn, and Police Commissioner Milo Grant. And just to frame this conversation for everyone, what we're going to do is uh, we earned ourselves a little extra time because of the um, public comment period not consuming any time. So what we're going to do is give each panelist four minutes at the top of this discussion to discuss or to explain specifically, do they see a change in crime rates in Burlington based on their sources? And do they connect that change to the reduced policing levels that we currently have. The second part of their comments will address what they see as the optimum or ideal makeup of the police force in terms of the numbers of police officers and their roles. So essentially, what is your ideal police force? So I'm just gonna start at the top of my list and go down. And so Karen Paul, if you could talk to us about how you see crime rates, policing levels, and your vision for the police force going forward. And yeah, um, Michelle, I'm sort of chasing a dog around. I did not hear what you had started with. Maybe you could just, uh, you know, I think most people are probably interested in hearing what the police officers have to say. Um, and thought maybe it would be okay if we could start with them. I apologize, I didn't hear the beginning of that. So we will, I'm actually just gonna go down my list. So Joan, if you're prepared to uh, talk on those points, that would be great. We wanna hear from our counselors as well as the police officers. Um, Thank you for holding this forum. I think it's it's great to have the opportunity to have this discussion. Um, I wish I had some magic answers to, to offer, but in terms of increased crime, I would say yes. I am, you know, just gauging by constituent reports from Porch Forum and my own experience. I would say that crime is up. Um, these boards, when they're showing their, their, you know, tests and proven, as opposed to reducing the police force and then hoping for the best. So that, that was, I suppose that's my idea of vision for the police force, kind of reduce it when we know it's safe and, and we, we, we have that ability. That's great. So just one technical issue. I don't know where your microphone is, but before my speaks, I'm wondering if you folks can get closer to your mic just because it's a bit garbled. Yeah. Um, so a, a closer mic will, I think, help our situation. 
So much for Cameron is there, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle, is he also an active policeman or is yes. he a union? He's both. Sure. He represents yeah, a union and he's yeah. a police officer. Look at that, great shot. Should be, should be Cameron. Is that where the microphone is, though? Uh, also, the problem, the system is why they probably can't hear us. Oh, yeah, and you're also content about a couple of facts in here, too. So in terms of our next uh, panelist, I would like to turn to Milo. Are you ready, Milo, to go ahead? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, taking uh, the question about increase in crime, I guess it really depends on people's personal experience, life experiences, and also where they live in the city. Uh, because we're policed differently in the city, uh, some people live in areas where they have, quite frankly, learned to put up with certain stuff. So they have a higher tolerance or they take extra steps that some people might not take in another part of the city because they never felt the need to. Um, Going back to the uh, example of bikes, uh, bikes have, have rampant bike theft has been an issue in the city of Burlington for decades. And there's nothing really preventative that the department can do other than encourage people to register bikes so that they can be returned if they're found. What is new is that due to the increasing popularity of e-bikes, and you also need chargers for e-bikes, those are now getting stolen, but bike theft overall has always been an issue. So there's certain things that have quite frankly always been an issue. Um, increased vandalism with cars, even before the cap was changed, this was already increasing, these crimes of opportunity. And I think these crimes of opportunity are related to uh, something that I do feel has been an increasing problem, is that um, we have a severe drug problem in this city. There are more quote unquote trap houses. Um, and I'm trying to work with some people in my community about what can we do where the community is actively assisting the department in terms of building a case. But I think there is definitely increased drug activity and the, the appetite for drugs in our community is bringing people in our community to sell. I think people not reporting gunshots is not that they don't care. I think the issue with fireworks going off so frequently, um, people just don't know if it's a firework or a gunshot. I don't think, I think if people could say for sure it was a gunshot as opposed to the fireworks that go off in a lot of areas of the city, that they would, um, that they would report it. Uh, so I definitely have heard people mention things like that. Oh, that was a shooting? Oh, I, I thought it could have been a fireworks because we've been having fireworks issues for a while now. Um, and that's actually a national issue. I don't know it's related to the pandemic, but it's part of these behaviors, um, increase in violent crime nationally, increase in murder rates nationally. Um, you know, we are seeing some of those trends as well. So I, I think uh, regarding some things, people are overreacting and need to take steps, uh, more preventative steps. Um, but with some cases related to drug activity, uh, use in homes, use near schools, um, issues around the parks, that's always been there. I, I So Milo, have you have about 45 seconds. Mental health and it's all so, Milo, oh, if you sorry? could also, yeah, you have about 40, well, 40 seconds left. I'd love to hear what your vision is. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't That's realize okay. time was flying that past. Um, I would say I would, uh, the conversation around the number of police officers, I would leave to other people. I am more concerned about having an integrated public safety that incorporates a CAHOOTS model, that incorporates the CSLs, that incorporates the CSOs. I think the uh, change in cap was kind of a, a shock to the system for sure, but I think it's, made, it's dragged some people into conversations that they did not want to participate in. I have heard a lot where people said this wasn't discussed. That's actually not true. There was a lot of discussion, but people, didn't want to participate. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, Karen, I'd like to bounce to you if you'd like to share your thoughts on the three points we discussed. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so um, 
As far as um, what was the per, what is what, the so, first question is what have I heard or what? Right, your perception of crime rates have they changed? And based on the sources you refer to, has have crime rates changed? Do you link that to policing levels? And then thirdly, what is your vision for the police force? Um, okay, well, you know, obviously anything that I've heard as far as crime levels is anecdotal um, in terms of the number of people that have reached out to me or things that I have seen on Front Porch Forum. Um, I think the the reduction in the number of officers has certainly heightened people heightened people's awareness of you know what the police do, what they can respond to, what they um, how they prioritize things. Um, and so you know, yes, there have been. A, a number of posts on front porch form about, you know, bicycles and, um, you know, different kinds of vandalism or, um, you know, people who have gone through, you know, rifling through cars, um, you know, whether or not the car's doors are unlocked or not unlocked. Um, and, you know, that is concerning to people. I mean, anything that is a violation of your personal space is, of course, concerning to people. Um, uh, so, you know, and as far as the data is concerned, I mean, I think that's sort of a bit of a mixed bag is, you know, as Oren has said, you know, they, not all of the things that we are looking for in terms of how crimes or incidents are, how incidents and how they are responded to are categorized or necessarily as helpful as perhaps they could be. Um, for example, I mean, we know that mental health calls are, um, are dramatically up. It's also how are they how are they categorized when um, you know when they're reported and then when the officer fills out the paperwork that they need to fill out. Um, as far as the as far as the other answer, because I know I'm only limited to four minutes, um, I I think that just as many. My experience has been in Ward Six that just as many people as there are who have reached out to me with concerns about the reduction in officers. Um, uh, there are also a number that have reached out to me very hopeful that this can be a time of transformation in our, the way that we police. Um, the, as Milo had men has mentioned, and the police commission has done a tremendous amount of work um, to, uh, you know, in, with, with NACOL to uh, encourage CSLs, CSOs, and what is really exciting is the CAHOOTS model that, you know, is now going to be out to an RFP um, and will really, I believe, you know, change how we respond to mental health calls. Um, Karen, I'm so, going to interrupt you for um, a second. You know, as far Karen? as the, the number of officers, the Karen? only thing I can say about that is that yeah. I have always, always advocated and wrote the resolution to create an airport police division. The airport police should not count as patrol officers because that is not what they do. They rotate in and out, but it's still the same number. And I think those are the kinds of conversations that we will begin to have so that um, we right size our police force, but are also cognizant of the fact that not all officers are out on Burlington streets um, uh, patrolling or supervising. Um, so I hope that's probably my, that's probably my four minutes. So I'll, it is your four I'll, minutes. I'll let it go with that. That was perfect timing. Karen, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. That actually, yes. that timing was perfect. I would like someone to just, anyone can chime in. What is a CFL or a CSO? We are lay people, most of us, and it would be helpful to know what those acronyms represent. So um, I'm going to probably get it wrong, but I'll give it a try. One of them is community, um, let's see, community uh, service officers, um, and the other is um, community support liaisons. And I don't think one of the C's is community. Um, okay. We tend to get them confused because they are so close. Um, but I'm sure Milo, I'm sure would know. Okay. Um, well, you I'm, can correct me because I, I don't think I have one of them right. Okay. Well, we can come back to that, but it sounds like a type of officer may be in a special role. That's not. Well, typical. they're non, they're non-sworn, they're non-sworn officers, Michelle. Okay. 
All right, that's helpful to know. So our yeah, I'm sorry if I may. Um, one is more um, geared toward mental health issues and working directly, uh, taking calls, um, assisting police if necessary. The other is more for things like if there's a traffic accident and it's just a quote unquote fender bender, do you need a sworn officer, you know, putting that report together that insurance companies require? That's great. Um, another type of personnel that's being looked at are park rangers, oh. which I think are going to be really helpful. And we have a lot of issues with the beaches, with people doing fires late at night. Um, a lot of that's been going on also. So um, Milo, I actually Church have to Street stop you to make uh, sure Seville that we park have time for our next just speaker. the other parks around town, having park rangers. So looking at different personnel, the types of personnel that are not actually sworn officers that will complement uh, police for an overall public safety system. Thank you. Okay, thanks Milo, I appreciate that. I just wanna make sure that we have time for Mai Win. Lieutenant Mai Win is our last panelist to take this individual time. And um, Mai, why don't you go ahead and respond to those issues about crime rates, connection to policing levels, and your vision for the police force. Um, are you able to share my... Uh... Yes. We have a... Yep. We have a spreadsheet that we're going to put up for everyone to view, and Kirsten Wilson is working on that right now. Okay, Mai, take it away. So, uh, Michelle contacted me on October 4th, wondering if I can, you know, um, speak on this. Uh, so I created this uh, spreadsheet by doing, and I put the search, uh, how I did the search in there, um, birth and call test, start date, and end date. So we started from January 1st, 2017, um, all the way to 2020-21, and uh, we end each of the search day on October 4th, because that's the day that um, Michelle contacted me. It wouldn't be fair to search it by the whole and entire year, because this year hasn't passed yet. But this is the data that uh, we gather. If you look on top, those are the total calls. So as you can see, uh, 2021, uh, we're only at uh, 16,000. 636, 2020, we were at 18, 9, 23, 2019, we're, you know, about 22,000, 2018, 23,000, 2017, 26,000. So over the years, um, the number of calls went down. However, um, if you look at the uh, data that I present right there, the crime rate, um, the uh, homicide or um, attempted is up, uh, aggravated assault is up. Um, simple assault is somewhat down, but uh, not quite. Um, domestic disturbance is way up. Robbery is down. Uh, reckless endangerment, which is uh, shooting, pretty much that what that is, is way up. Um, now, some some incident are categorized that because uh, you know um, if you shoot at somebody and you have a victim, it's um, an aggravated aggravated assault. Um, so reckless endangerment is up at 10. Um, disturbance is way up, it's uh, 722 so far this year. Um, the most important rise is the uh, property crime. Uh, burglary is way up, we're at 143. Last year we're at 82. Um, stolen vehicle, is, uh, we're at 94. Last year we're at uh, 50. Uh, people break into, into cars, uh, 407. Last year we were at 250. Uh, um, people stealing from houses, uh, 151. Uh, so we're up, uh, large thing per person, like uh, you know, somebody snatched your purse, stuff like that, is up. Last year we were at five, this year we're at 16. Um, stolen bikes, stuff like that, 253. And you know, people breaking windows, slashing tire, keying cars, we're at uh, 264 compared to 189 of last year. Um, Drugs, uh, we're at 445 last year at uh, 51, and I'll explain why. 
Um, overdoses are way up. We're at 104. Last year we were at 72. And as you see, 2019, 2018, and 2017, they're quite uh, lower, like 38, 43, and 54. Um, now, if you look down um, towards the with traffic, we're way down. We're at 549. Um, we don't have time to do car stop or stuff like that as much. Um, we don't have enough, uh, you know, people to walk on foot, so we're down at 218. Uh, community outreach is down, 247. Um, suspicious event is down, is 1504. Now, those are, in general, the incidents where the officer are proactive. They go out, they do stuff, they find stuff to do. When you stop a car, you can find drugs in the car, you can find guns in the car. People are wanna end in, in the car, people are drunk. Uh, you know, this way uh, you have uh, DUI. Um, so when people say crime is down because the incident number is down, that's not true. Um, it's just we don't have the resources to deal with them. And um, so pro as you can see, probably crime is way up. Um, part of that is the reason being is that uh, back in 2017, we created a street crime unit to deal with like, you know, burglary, car breaks. Um, you know, people slashing your tires, stuff like that. Uh, due to our staffing changes, we have to um, disband that. You know, before it was uh, four officer and one sergeant, and eventually we break it down to one officer and one sergeant, and now we have zero. Um, eventually, we're going to have to probably get rid of the um, domestic violence unit as well, which right now we'll, we'll, we only have one. But as our number continues to drop, um, we just don't have the resources to, uh, you know, staff these uh, positions because, you know, 911 calls keep, uh, still come, comes in. At any given time, an officer is on a call. There's three, four more calls that are stacked waiting for him. Um, so that's the issue that we have. We just go from call to call to call. Um, we're just kind of reduced to being call takers right now, which we don't even have time to, you know, um, sit down, write our uh, reports and stuff like that, which, you know, it, it's... Uh, you know, last tour I worked night shift, and it was normal for me to work 15 to 18 hours every day. That was normal. Um, we have an officer work a long shift, drove home, and fell asleep behind the wheel and crashed his car. I mean, I, I can tell you last tour when I worked night shift, I was driving home at, you know, sometime 8 a.m. in the morning. My shift ends at 2. Sometimes I don't go home till like 8, 9, 10 um, in the morning. And as I'm driving home, I'm literally having the windows down, the AC's up, and I'm slapping my my myself as I'm driving so I don't crash. Um, that's the issue that we have is that we just don't have enough staffing right now and the number is going to continue to go down. Um, you know, I, there's a, a number of people that are looking to leave right now and unfortunately we can't stop them. So um, the number is just going to go way down and I just don't know how we're going to be able to handle that when, when that time comes. So my thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Whoa, that was something. So my thank you for giving us what's that information. The, what's the unit of measure? Are we talking incidents, arrests, prosecutions? Just one sec. So we're going to now take comments and questions from participants. So um, I trust one of our people is looking for raised. I'm not actually sure how this works on this webinar but we do have someone in person who has a question and we'll go to that and then if other folks want to chime in please do okay peter what's the unit of measure are we talking police interactions are we talking interventions arrests prosecutions i don't know the unit of measure are you referring to the data yeah so my can you respond to that so these are just calls that we go to, you know, like if um, somebody committed a robbery, do we log on as a robbery? Um, so these are just calls that are logged into our system when someone calls the police and we go to it. So they're individual calls. Okay. Yeah. Amanda. Amanda is with us in person and has a comment or question. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm concerned in reading the CNA report that we're, we're realizing now that we, we need more specialization uh, in mental health, in, in response to, to substance use disorder, but we're, we're taking away that specialization within the police department. Um, 
particularly in the domestic violence unit, um, where the domestic violence prevention or officer, and in QC, um, we're talking about reducing the number of officers that we send there. Uh, those are those are crimes that are particularly sensitive. Um, for domestic violence, they're often repeat events. Uh, it's it's nice to have actual community policing, which at least the, the investigating officer is going to be the same person. So I know I'm going to go to the mat for those positions. I want to know with the CNA report, anyone that can answer, the top tier of, of the range uh, in the CNA report, is that assuming that we keep those positions? Or is the top tier assuming that we are not including those positions per their recommendation? Yeah, I, I believe the top tiers did keep some of them. Uh, I've read the report, but I don't have a commitment to memory. I'm sorry. Um, I'd have to refer to it again. There is on, on one of the, the last pages of the, the staffing section, it had a breakdown of what the lower tier was and what the top tier was. Um, I want to say the top tier had a domestic violence office, uh, prevention officer, but yeah, I, I, I can't say for certain. Do you do that? I believe that the top the the top tier number eighty eight included the domestic violence officer and full staffing for Kuzi and the lower number eighty five reduced the staffing for Kuzi, eliminated the domestic violence officer. But my read of it was that those numbers also were with an assumption of twelve hour shifts, which we don't have. and they put a lot of emphasis on getting efficiencies through 12 hour shifts, which is a, that would have to be negotiated with, with the union. And I think really discussed by the public and multiple bodies to determine, um, cause while they pushed for that, they also said there is no best practice, whether it's eight, 10 or 12 hour shifts. Thanks, Joan. Um, Meg McGovern has her hand up and then Wedge has their hand up, so we'll go in that order. And then Milo, you can comment after that. So Meg, if you want to- Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Uh, thank you all. Great to see everyone. I was just curious if there was a way to split off um, what, how many events happened in Ward 6 or the South End, specifically 27 Sears Lane or a new place on Shelburne Road if that's something that we are able to focus on since we all live in those neighborhoods. Yeah, we can pull the Valcor data that shows how many incidents have occurred at Sears Lane and how many incidents have occurred at a new place very easily. Um, just just for the record, a uh, new place is not in Ward 6. A new place is in Ward 5. And Sears Lane is also in Ward 5. No, I understand what Joan is speaking. So she, I think she represents that area, so I was just curious of that information, but so thank you for the answer. I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, and I would say that we certainly hear from people who live across Shelburne Road um, from Ward 6 about, um, particularly about a new place, but also um, a lot of business owners in the Sears Lane vicinity live in Ward 6 as well. Great, so. Well, the only, re the only reason I mentioned that is just simply that if we're looking for data just for Ward 6, we'd have to include, if you want that information, we'd have to include that, but that would not be, that would be separate from just isolating Ward 6. That's all. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Joan. Wedge. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, the Wedge stands for Walter Judge. So I'm at 99 Cliff Street. Thanks for, um, for recognizing me. Um, I was dumbstruck by the uh, amazing jump in the property crimes category. Um, in all or most of those instances, it looked like almost a doubling um, over the prior year. Um, and of course, I'm uh, attuned to that because um, uh, uh, a week and a half ago, I was a victim of a property crime myself. My car on Cliff Street was broken into. Um, and uh, having lived in Burlington for four years and worked in Burlington for 30, um, that was the first time I've ever had uh, a property crime perpetrated on me. Um, 
So I, I question, and I have not reported it to the police yet, um, uh, in part because um, I'm just a little bit despondent about whether or not it makes any difference, other than a, a, changing the statistics a tiny bit. Um, I, I know that nothing's going to happen about the fact that my car was broken into, uh, and I wonder if the the statistics on property crime that you know are amazingly as doubled as they were are still underreported because people like me uh, believe that um, it makes no difference whether I report it or not. Um, nothing's going to happen. Um, and uh, just to respond to the uh, to a to, to a previous speaker. I have to say that hearing that, well, we've always had car break-ins and things like that is not really much solace to me when I'm thinking about whether or not we have enough police officers in the city of Burlington. Um, when my car, uh, when I'm a victim of a property crime for the first time, um, and hopefully not again anytime soon, uh, and, and the perception is out there that, well, there aren't enough officers, then the answer is we need more police officers and not um, being told that, oh, well, um, we've always had property crimes, so don't worry about it. That's my comment, thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, Milo, I know you had your hand up, but I wanna hear from some folks who haven't spoken yet. So uh, Tiff Bloomley had her hand up, it, and then it, it, Devin, and then Corey. <laughs> Tiff, do you wanna uh, share your comments? Yeah, hi, Tiff Bloomley. Um, uh, from Chittenden 65 in the House of Reps. I'm, I'm concerned about, and you said, um, uh, actually, Milo, you had said that there was an RFP that was going out for the CAHOOTS model, um, a, a, a CAHOOTS type program here. And <clears throat> given what I know about the mental health capacity in the state and and in Burlington, I'm just wondering if there's any concern that the police commission has about the ability to um, act, satisfy, um, you know, the the that program. Whether whether there is any organization that has the ability um, to run it. What is cahoots? Uh, it is a um, program that actually started out in. Um, uh, Oregon, and it, it has a 30-year history, and it is a, a, a means of um, using mental health professionals to address a lot of um, incidents that police would normally um, attend to, and there's a whole kind of separate, um, um, what's the word, uh, you know, it, they're called first to um, a scene, and they, they are asked to address it anyway. It's a it's been very well um, documented and reviewed, and, and I know it's something that's of great interest to um, a lot of people in the city. It's been they've there've been a couple of meetings about it. Okay, <clears throat> so I think there was a question. There was. It just do we have the capacity here? Okay, and Milo, if you can respond as quickly as possible to that, and then we have Devin and Corey with hands up. We want to hear from. Sure, uh, so I want to clarify something that I said earlier. I, I didn't say that you know people shouldn't worry about it. I said that perception is different based on people's personal experiences and where they live in the city. Um, and that is an issue with certain crime like bike theft that has been with us for a very long time and increasing the number of police officers may not directly affect a crime like that. And drugs are a huge issue and drugs I believe are the source of why we see all these crimes of opportunity, people breaking in and trying to break into homes, people trying to break into cars, looking for things of value so they can get a fix, et cetera. Kahoot, I think, is a fantastic idea. This is a model that is being looked at across the country. It has been hugely successful after you have it, an initial investment. It saves a lot of money. Um, when it can become part of an overall public safety system. Now, do we have the resources? That's a very good question. We know for a fact that our society cut back on mental health funding, and we are really paying for it now. Yeah. We are really paying for it now. The people that are in the mental health field, field do amazing work, but they are underpaid. 
they are underpaid. So sometimes there's a lot of turnover. So that that will be part of it. Um, the Howard Center will certainly uh, be involved in some way. Uh, there will be coordination with the CSLs. You know, but that is part of the the um, the process to to put this all together once um, funding goes through. For anyone who would like information, please feel free to email me. I can send you a couple of articles on Cahoots so that you have an idea of how it's worked out mm -hmm. in Oregon, and also send you links to the presentation. There was a presentation at a commission meeting, and also there's a document that summarizes that presentation, and I'm happy to send that to anyone who would like, and my email address is uh, on the city's website. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you, Milo. So, folks, we have decided there is interest in this topic from our participants. We're going to continue for another little bit here to make sure we can hear from those who want to speak. It's going to delay our other agenda items. My apologies to the presenters on those items. Um, Karen, I can see you're interested in jumping in, but I do want to just hear from Devin first and then come back to you. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, I applaud the city and the police commission and the city council for looking at this issue because it certainly is complicated. Um, Reimagining public safety, I, I think, is a very noble goal. So my, my, I guess my struggle is a year and a half ago, a decision was made to drop the police force by 30 percent. The process there at that time, it did not appear that there were the right RFPs and steps in place to ensure a sort of continued baseline of public safety. I think the you know, comments from some of the panelists, crime rates, you know, drop in numbers in the police force kind of support that conclusion. The, 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 the statement was made that no changes can be made until we have this, you know, CNA report that was just released. Now that we have the, that report and those findings are there and the, that report does support that the, you know, number of officers on the police department should be raised. What is the plan uh, from the city and the police commission to address that and you know, build bridges towards the Burlington Police Department and start to raise that officer level again. Thanks, Devin. Karen, do you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, I would. But first, I just want to explain that the CAHOOTS program is, it stands for Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets. It's a mobile crisis intervention program that started in 1989 in Eugene, Oregon, as a collaboration between the White Bird Clinic and the city of Eugene. Um, there are, this came to Burlington as a result of citizens. This did not come from City Hall. This came from citizens who are very, very interested in bringing this forward. Um, they had, um, they have done a tremendous amount of work on this. Um, a, a, it's a group of parents who have been impacted by mental crisis, mostly from their children. And um, uh, there is an RFP. Um, Bob Bick has been involved in that RFP. We've had a number of meetings about this, um, and the RFP is going uh, is going out very, very shortly. Um, with and there and there is the capacity. I think it was Tiff who asked. There is the capacity for that. There is a significant amount of interest. It may not come from all from one organization, um, but I think that. Uh, you know, as far as funding, the city has allotted four hundred thousand dollars for it. Um, there is the hope of getting more from the hospital as well as from the state. Uh, the state got a lot of money for mental health, and we're hoping to tap into that as well. There will be a resolution on creating a mental health summit um, that will happen probably uh, either at the very end of this year or in January of 2022. Um, as far as the answer to the question, the city council just recently passed unanimously a recruitment and retention plan on $10,000 to each officer who stays for one year, as well as a recruitment effort to, um, you know, to recruit officers. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that are going on that, you know, what Devin had asked, um, what the plan is for that. Um, you know, it's a multifaceted approach to building the um, the number of police officers. But you know, this is this is not something that's going to happen overnight. It is going to take time, 
And as we do that, we are hoping to be able to um, uh, attract, as we talked about, the CSLs and CSOs to respond to many of the incidents that, that sworn officers are responding to now. Um, and quite honestly, you know, there are probably, you know, better uses of their time um, to respond to incidents that we really need them to respond to. So, sorry, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> okay, Karen, thanks for, for going. So, Corey and Hans, I've been told that we have time for one more question, but I'm wondering if you two could say them your questions quickly so we could get two for one. Well, I, yeah, I mean, this is Corey. I well, can, I we'll can do Corey first. and I, then Hans. I essentially, um, just so you guys know, I live in uh, Ward 6 and I own my own business in Ward 5. Um, and my question is sort of dovetails on what Devin was saying. Um, he kind of took the words out of my mouth, so I'll be, I'll be fairly quick. I've seen, you know, crime anecdotally as well, as Karen said, across the board going up 100%. Um, I won't get into the details uh, for the sake of time. But, you know, as, the, as, as we all know, the, the force was cut. That's cool, whatever. That's, that's a decision that was made at the time. I'll support all the decisions that were made. Um, but what we need to try to figure out is like, what are we doing now? There's been a lot of RFP talk. There's been a lot of uh, symposiums and organizations and we're gonna overthink it. And it seems like a, a bit of paralysis by analysis. So like, what can we do now? Because as a business owner that's being impacted both financially um, and just mostly financially having my business across the street from what is now the um, encampment on, in the South End, what are we doing now and I know that like you sort of answered that, but I guess it's it's maybe less of a question and it's more like we need to like do something because we've, we've had the time to think about this. We're being a little wishy-washy. I mean, we either need to, to give money to this. I mean, the CAHOOTS organization, it's, it's, a, it's a lot bigger of an organization, but it has a $1.8 million budget and 176 employees, 176,000, excuse well, me. Well, Corey, employees. thank you. In the, in the, the for... population of the city of, of, of Eugene, sorry. Okay, so, like, that's okay. We need to do it and we need to do something because there's definitely paralysis by analysis and it's just, it's not working out because life is continuing to go on and life is continu continuing to be impacted in a really okay. bad way. Okay, thanks, Corey. I'm going to uh, steer now to Hans if you could make your comment as concisely as possible. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Hans Van Wies. I live in Ward 6, and I, I feel we're still not addressing the issue. Um, and uh, first of all, I, I, I am very appreciative of the officers that are uh, here tonight and that. Uh, Put themselves in, uh, in in danger for protecting us. Um, the uh, with the reduction in police force. And let me first make clear: I fully understand cahoots and the other programs. I think it's indeed the direction to go. But what we did do is we quickly defunded the police department. And I'll give you just one example. And I know it was brought up earlier that some of these crimes have shifted in neighborhoods and are interpreted in different ways. I live in a neighborhood where we were dealing with a drug dealing on the corner of the street where there were six families living with uh, about 15 children that play on the street uh, between finding needles and uh, but seeing active drug action taking place and uh, many of us actively reporting to the police and then finding out being told like I'm sorry there are 10 calls that are more important at the moment we cannot act to this. And you're standing there and you see the you see the transaction taking place. It's happening in front of you and your children. And there is no the police cannot respond. That is infuriating. That's that that is that is like a century ago. So I I, I have completely support these programs, but I am asking the city council to take action, follow the recommendations now that they're out, and increase the police force and give the citizens and the residents of Burlington a sense that some action is being taken. And, and I, again, I fully support the other programs, but they're not off the ground. There's two mental health workers that were hired. You know where they came from? The Howard Center. I work for a business downtown that relies significantly on the Howard Center, Howard Center Outreach Program. That program is overburdened. These people do tremendous jobs. I have the greatest respect for them. They cannot handle them. I know shopkeepers that are dealing with people shooting up in front of the street in their in their their shop, urinating in their building. 
uh, on and on. Open container laws, it's, it feels like a lawless society. And when you live in a neighborhood here and you have drug dealing taking place and you call the police repeatedly and they can't come, then I say there is a problem. We, 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 we reduce this force too much. We still need a baseline. And all the others, Devin, Corey, whoever it was here on this call have mentioned that. And so thank you for your time, but I'm, I, I, I feel like we've gone too far and we need to take action. And I look at the city council to pass a resolution to first of all, bring that police come back to a base because it's going to take a year to get there and it's going to get a year, two years, three years to fill the boots programs and the other program and the other program because we're in a very labor short market right now. If we think we can just have Hans, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to ask you to wipe, to wrap it up. Thank you. I appreciate your sharing that. Here. So one of the things that um, we have, uh, and one of the things I have in front of me right now, is uh, Tiff and Gabrielle, our representatives from uh, our one of our Ward Five, Ward Six districts, have donated their 15 minutes to this issue. If folks would like to continue, now. Um, I don't want to make a unilateral decision from the steering committee for the steering committee, but if our other presenters could just sit tight and um, what I would like to do is take uh, Tiff and uh, Gabrielle's time and allow the folks with raised hands to speak again. I'm going to limit you to four minutes, Joan, Milo and Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Tiff and Gabrielle and Michelle. Um, I wanted to just speak briefly to the CAHOOTS program, which I think is awesome. Um, and I fully support bringing that to Burlington. But I want to note that when the CAHOOTS model was implemented in Eugene, the police were not defunded. The police recognized the defunding of mental health, which we have um, We've been suffering from for decades, and it really got a lot worse after um, the Waterbury facility was flooded in the 2011 floods. And um, it, was, it was really bad before that, but it's worse now. And so we've had actually the same number of police. Um, when I came on the council in 2003, we were, I believe the cap then was 105. And so that number has remained steady as the police have been the ones left to handle the mental health care crisis. And they shouldn't be. And that's where something like CAHOOTS can really, really come in and deal with it so much better. Um, so I, I support, support that. I also um, am trying to bring forward a resolution that I hope will be acted on October 18th to raise the um, police cap to the 88, which includes the domestic violence officer and the um, Kuzi officers. It doesn't take into account the 12-hour um, shifts, but honestly, we're able to hire police right now. And really what this would do would be send a message to those we're trying to hire that we are going to be funding our police in a way that there will be people who have their back. They're not going to be on forced overtime, you know, indefinitely as um, is the case now. Uh, people are really overworked and we need to do all we can to attract people. And I think raising the cap is um, essential to that. Thank you. Joan, I appreciate that. Before we go to Milo, I am going to be the acronym police and ask Joan to just spell out, speak out, QZ. Uh-oh. <laughs> I think it has something uh, to do with special yeah, crimes. You, you had to ask me that? Uh-uh. Yeah. Chindin unit for special investigations or something. That's coming out of my brain, and I'm not even in this business. Chindin but unit for special investigations. Unit. Okay. Okay. If, I hope folks heard that. It's like a special unit. Okay. And Karen's saying yes. Okay. I think Milo was up next. Is that correct or was it Karen? Milo, are you there? 
Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, so I heard loud and clear the discussion about uh, the open dealing going on in residential areas. I've been working with some individuals in Ward 3 who have had a problem. Actually, that's been going on for three years and is now escalated to the point where we're pretty sure some serious trafficking is going on there, given what they're reporting with regards to out-of-state cars showing up in certain numbers during certain times of the day. And just trying to say um, to the police department, what can the community do to help you make a case or help make it federal so the feds come in and do an investigation? And the police commission at our last meeting, we made a request of the police department that they do a presentation to address those questions because it is something that we are hearing about and as opposed to being told like we don't have the time to respond we can't help you uh well what did you think based on where you live without whoops i think we lost audio for you milo all right so um did i Oren, did you want to say something i just want to move a little closer you might not be able to see me but can you hear me better karen i'm going to put you on pause just for a sec because it sounds like joe is coming in to say something is that right can you hear me better yeah okay um so i'm actually a narcotics detective currently um and i think it doesn't really get talked about a lot for what the narcotics unit looks like currently, but due to the defunding, there's two narcotics detectives and one sergeant in that unit right now for the entire city to handle all narcotics investigations. Um, I'm one of those detectives. I have a full caseload, so does my partner, and uh, our sergeant assists us in every way that he can. Um, I have sealed a lot of your complaints when it comes to the tip line. I'm actually the one that runs the tip line. Uh, and we get all of your complaints and your tips. The problem is, is that I can only take on so many cases and so can my partner due to the defunding and not having, we used to have a, a four officers in the drug unit, as well as a sergeant, um, and we had a full street crime unit, which was also another three to four officers and a sergeant. We were able to uh, handle narcotics investigations much more, much, much more narcotics investigations in general. Um, so that's the issue right now that we're running into. We, are have, we don't have the resources to keep up with the drug information, as well as the drugs uh, the drug issues in the in the city. Um, so that's that's the biggest issue we're running into. Uh, so raising the cap, yeah, that would that would mean a lot to us, and it would also help us be able to uh, fill the specialized units to actually handle these calls. The reason a lot of times when you call, you get a police officer, you get a dispatch that tells you the police officers can't come, is because they're tied up on other things. Yes, uh, but also some of those things require lengthy investigations that may last a month, two months, three months until so we can actually act um, to have a big enough case to move forward um, with that stuff. So unfortunately, some of that does come down to the fact that it takes time to get through these investigations to build a big enough case um, to actually uh, criminally prosecute the people that need to be prosecuted. Uh, but also it comes out of the fact that we don't have the manpower right now due to the, due to the defunding um, to fill our specialized units. The specialized units were bigger, but then once we lost officers, they became smaller, smaller, and smaller. And unfortunately, there is talk of the drug unit disappearing by next year if we don't start uh, filling our numbers back up. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate your chiming in there. Um, it's good to have that perspective. Karen, we just have like three minutes left. If you could respond with your comments. That, that's all right. I, I, I'm happy to, Michelle, but the thing is, if there are other questions, I'd rather give residents the opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you, Karen. So Suzanne, would you hop in please? And you have just two and a half minutes, sorry. We've pushed our other presenters about as far as we can. Thank you so much. I just wanna say, I appreciate that there's a lot of uh, common thinking happening here. I think the area six or ward six residents want to fund the police they want us to have you know community protection and we want to protect citizens um, who have mental health issues as well 
I, I'm hearing a lot of um, agreement and I'm not hearing a lot of solutions. Um, and I, I want to know from our representatives, how can residents who believe we should be funding the police more, uh, we should be funding all these programs more, speak up in other forums besides their local neighborhood where they're in agreement with their neighbors? And how do we, um, you know, collaborate with people in other parts of Burlington who may have a different perspective so that we're not um, dividing our city, but we're working together. Okay, Karen, one minute. And I'm sorry to be okay. so time sensitive, but we have we okay. didn't anticipate quite this much activity. All so right. no go for it. No problem. So the question that you just asked, Suzanne, is the same question that two <laughs> other people have asked me today. Um, and one of them is actually on this on this uh, as well. Um, there is, um, as Joan has mentioned, there what there there may well be a resolution to talk about we're increasing the um, the authorized uh, head count at the next our next council meeting, which is October 18th. Um, you know, please keep in mind that we are two of 12. Um, and my suggestion, um, and Joe may have a different perspective, but my suggestion is that um, uh, city council at burlingtonbt.gov is the way to reach all city councilors at the same time. You send us an email, it goes to each of us. Um, we read our emails. You can send them separately by going on the city website. Um, at the next meeting, we will have the hybrid model so that you can um, participate in public forum via Zoom that is in the final stages of being um, implemented. And it's hoped that we'll have it for the next meeting. And conversations, phone calls to other city councilors outside of Ward 6 um, is always very helpful um, you know we are uh you know there are 12 different perspectives on this issue and in order for us to be able to increase the officer headcount um we need to develop broad consensus among our colleagues and i think that is incredibly important not only because yes we need that in order to enact a resolution but i think we also need that so that we can begin building trust um, and building collaboration um, so that there is, we are sending a clear message such as the one that we did with the un, uh, unanimous support for the recruitment and retention plan. That's great, Karen, thank you so much. Uh, Joan, I'm gonna actually, Joan, I'm gonna ask you to put you on pause. You have a slot coming up, uh, it's your city council update. I'm gonna let you speak to whatever it is you've got on your mind at that point, but what we have done is very uncharacteristic for our NPA, which is just kind of like let time unspool in a way it never <laughs> has before. And I want to just thank everyone who showed up to discuss um, this issue for their participation, especially our panelists, but everyone else who has shown up to listen and to ask questions. Thank you very much. Um, so we have to just go right into our voter redistricting topic and our uh, panelists for there are not panelists our participants for that um, consist of Rama Kocher Lakota he is our ward 6 representative to the ad hoc committee on redistricting and then Karen Paul you're not gonna we're not gonna let you go anywhere you're gonna stay right there so folks if you want to just make that transition from policing to redistricting please sit tight and listen to our presenters. Thank you. Hi, um, I, as Michelle said, I'm the uh, representative from Ward 6 to the Ad Hoc Committee on Redistricting. Um, as you probably know, um, every 10 years there's a census in the United States, and after the census, um, there's reevaluation of how all the um, electoral districts are set. And the uh, committee that I'm on is helping to uh, um, gather input so the city council can make recommendations for the uh, redistricting of um, the um, city council wards and districts in Burlington. So I have a, a short presentation that I put together. Um, oh, I cannot scream. I cannot share my screen. Okay. You should be able to now. I will tell you about it. Hey, hold on, Rama. We're going to. I'm sorry. You should. Get you so you can do that. I would try again now. 
Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, now my computer won't let me do it. There we go, Zoom. Excuse me, I'm sorry. This is taking longer than it should. Um, if you want to just talk your way through your presentation to start, please feel yeah, free to I'm, do I'm, that. I'm going to have to talk. No, my computer is misbehaving. So let me just tell you what's going on. Uh, so um, so the, com the committee is going to be holding uh, some public meetings where input is taken. We don't make any decisions about the uh, redistricting. We provide a report to city council about the input. So the um, committee will help get uh, the, the council gather input on general perspectives on the number of uh, councilors, uh, wards and districts, and options about current and most recent ward plans. Uh, the re redistricting process, so we're gonna be gathering this uh, input, and then we're gonna be uh, passing that information to uh, city council. <laughs> Um, um ho hopefully by november 8th um council will then use the ad hoc committee report to provide specific guidance to a mapping specialist who will provide a map to the council by december 13th and the goal is to have a um a map for consideration by voters on the march uh, 2022 ballot um after that it, um, burlington unlike most cities or towns of vermont uh, the um, map is part of the state charter so it actually has to be there has to be a, a change to the charter, which it, it has to go to Montpelier to be approved. So it, it takes a while. Um, so re redistricting um, each district, the, the most important factor here is each district should have um, yeah. approximately the same number of um, people in it as other districts. Not voters, people. Um, in, so it has to be within 10% according to the guidelines we were given. Uh, the territory to be contiguous. You can't just, you know, plop to um, uh, uh, sections of the city that are remote from each other and say that's one um, one ward. That's not okay. You cannot separate on the basis of race, ethnicity, or religion. Um, the less what they're describing is the should have maintain existing political subdivision lines, uh, honor natural and historic boundary lines. Uh, respect for communities of interest, um, provides uh, small districts meaningful representation, and the use of census blocks uh, for groups of houses and apartment buildings. Uh, in 2010, I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, there, just, there were a lot of things that they looked at in 2010. Again, the main thing was uh, the overall deviation uh, in population of the wards of the um, of the wards to be less than 10 percent. Um, additional considerations for 2021, people are curious about do we want to keep the same number of wards? Do we want to also have districts like we do now? Should areas of large student population be kept together or broken up into multiple wards? Um, do we want to keep neighborhoods intact? Um, do we want to have at-large city councilors? Multiple representatives per ward. So these are questions that, are, that city council is interested in having uh, input on. So if people have input, they should get it to me. Um, I have some graphs here that I can't show, but basically the, the population of the city has increased slightly over, since, over, since uh, 2010 when the last census was held. Uh, population of Ward 6 has increased more than the other wards, uh, except for maybe Ward 1, um, which means that Ward 6 will probably get shrunk. Um, we need... Um, so the, the wards that are large now are going to have to be reduced in size. So that's Ward 1, Ward 6, and Ward 8. Uh, and some of the other wards will be picking up more, more population. Um, another graph, the same message. Okay, so the ad hoc committee will be holding open meetings for public input. We were hoping to have three meetings, one in each of the south, north, and central parts of the city, but this is somewhat left in the air because of scheduling constraints. Um, if you have any input for me, please email me as uh, your Ward 6 representative. Um, I know I have a really complicated name to, to um, spell and pronounce, but um, my 
email address is just my first name followed by my last name, no punctuation, Lakota at gmail.com. Um, and I, I did have a posting on Front Porch Forum. Uh, oh, uh, oh, no, maybe yeah. a week ago, something like that. Uh, Matt Grady um, posted it more widely. Um, so uh, soliciting feedback uh, on redistricting. And um, so you sh if you uh, scroll back in the old Front Porch Forums, you should see uh, a posting from Matt uh, titled, soliciting uh, input on redistricting and my email address is in there. And just to make it quite clear, I'm not an elected official. Uh, my role in this is just an impartial conduit for your input. So um, if you have any feedback, if you have any information on how this pro uh, process should be run, if you have any feedback on what, uh, how the, the uh, redistricting should, should, what we, we should end up with um, in the end with redistricting, please email me, let me know what you have in mind. And then, do people have any questions? Well, thank you, Rama, for that explanation of your work on the ad hoc committee. Karen, I don't know if you're nodding in response to Rama or if you want to say something or you're listening to some music that we can't hear. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually just uh, like in awe of the fact that uh, um, Everything that Ram has said is exactly what we had hoped um, when the resolution was written, was to find just simply citizens who are interested in serving on the ad hoc committee uh, um, by resolution. No formerly effect elected or currently elected officials are on the ad hoc committee. The idea is for them to just simply be soliciting input. And the only thing I'll just say is that this is really important. Um, you know, if you have an opinion about, um, you know, how we are divide, how we are divided. Do you like the ward district system? Um, you know, five years ago we only had districts, um, and we only had wards. Um, do you prefer that? Do you prefer, um, you know, uh, you know, some cities have at large as opposed to by ward um, or by district? Those are important questions, and we only get to do this once every 10 years. So, um, you know, this is this is a pretty big deal. And, um, you know, now is the time. If you do have suggestions or input, um, your input absolutely is valued. Um, whatever we get from the ad hoc committee in, in terms of a report, that is going to guide the city council. And then we are going to be giving that information to the city's mapping specialist to come up with a map for um, for redistricting, which will then, of course, go be approved by the council and then um, will become a charter, would be on the ballot as a charter change. So that's all I, I thank you, Rama. Thank you so, so much for doing this work. Um, and uh, I hope that we will, I hope you will hear from many people. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Rama. Thank you, Karen. That's wonderful. So Darren Springer has been waiting in the green room for his presentation, <laughs> and he is going to talk to us about the net zero energy revenue bond proposal that I believe is an upcoming ballot item. And Darren, why don't you jump in and talk away about that? And um, just, yeah, thanks again, Rama and Karen, for that piece. <clears throat> well, hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Darren Springer, General Manager with Burlington Electric Department. Uh, I am joined by a colleague who's on as well, uh, Emily Stevens-Wheelock, our Manager of Strategy and Innovation. And uh, I respect that uh, you all are, are running a little behind, so I will try to move through our presentation expeditiously, but we're glad to answer questions about the Net Zero Energy Revenue Bond. Um, I'm going to share my screen here, um, just a moment, see if that worked. <clears throat> just another minute here. Um, okay, uh, I think the screen share is working. Uh, let me know if, if anybody can't see. Um, 
Just a brief reminder uh, for folks who may be less familiar, uh, Burlington Electric, public power utility for the city of Burlington, uh, providing electric service. Uh, we are 100% renewable uh, since 2014. And as folks know, we had a 12 year run without a rate increase uh, after the uh, pandemic impacts. Uh, we did have our first rate increase uh, with a surcharge that took effect on bills in August of 7.5%. The Revenue bond uh, that's being proposed has been uh, approved to be on a special election ballot uh, by the Electric Commission and City Council. Um, it is a bond that requires approval of majority of voters, and it is payable solely from Burlington Electric's rates and revenues. This is not uh, payable from the City General Fund. It does not impact on property taxes. Uh, this is something that is repaid through Burlington Electric's revenues and is solely an obligation of Burlington Electric. Uh, it doesn't affect the city's debt ratio or debt policy. Uh, we've had revenue bonds a number of times over the years uh, for some of our generation facilities like the McNeil uh, wood chip uh, plant and the Winooski hydropower dam. Uh, we also have, uh, I'll just jump to the next slide. Uh, we also have a historical analog in our energy efficiency bond from 1990. Uh, when we as a community uh, put forward an $11.3 million bond that really jump-started our energy efficiency investments in Burlington. And uh, that's yielded some significant results. Uh, even before COVID, uh, we're using more than 8%, uh, about 8.6% less electricity uh, we're using today than we were in 1989 uh, prior to that uh, revenue bond. And uh, that's partly the result of our energy efficiency investments. Um, what the net zero energy revenue bond is intended to do is invest in accelerating our progress on climate, on our net zero 2030 goal in Burlington, and also fund uh, reliability projects and uh, maintenance and infrastructure projects uh, that are, are needed uh, for our system. Uh, in particular, here are the different categories of investment. Uh, we roughly would have about 12.3 million going into the electric grid itself, uh, both for reliability and then also for upgrades as we move towards more heat pumps and electric vehicles uh, and electric uh, lawnmowers and other technologies. Uh, we're expecting that there will be a need for some grid upgrades, and this proposal accommodates that. Um, we have about 1,400 uh, incentives that have been provided from Burlington Electric to our customers over just the last few years to help with that transition. Um, and if folks are interested, please check out our website, uh, burlingtonelectric.com. You can see all of our different incentive programs for uh, EVs and heat pumps and other technologies. Um, about 3.9 million would go into technology uh, system investments. Uh, we have aging systems in some cases that need replacement. Uh, we also have new capabilities uh, with uh, these replacement systems. Uh, this is everything from how we get information from our meters to how we run our financial systems uh, to how we have customer information systems. Uh, all of those are involved in that $3.9 million <coughs> investment. Um, about 2.2 million would go into renewable uh, energy plants, including maintenance of existing plants and converting our uh, peaker plant, which runs on oil over to biodiesel. It's the only plant that we have any association with that's not already renewable, and this uh, proposal would, would make it renewable. And uh, last but not least, uh, about 1.5 million in other capital investments for more EV charging stations around the community, more programs to help us uh, save energy and reduce peak use uh, and investments in that area. Uh, so I've kind of run through this slide. I'll skip over it. Another key piece here, uh, as part of our climate progress, um, we would be able to use some of our existing annual bond funding uh, to essentially double the funding available for our customer incentives uh, for the next three years if this proposal is approved by the voters. And that would mean uh, having an incremental emissions reduction uh, beyond what we would do otherwise of about 47,000 tons, which is the equivalent of about 100,000 barrels of oil. Uh, so a significant emissions reduction uh, investment that we can make uh, in providing the community all the different incentive programs to help reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that's a part of this proposal as well. Uh, this is just showing here uh, that we're actually doing even better uh, by a significant margin than what the state requires of us in that area. Uh, the state 
renewable energy standard has some requirements for utilities to offer programs to help customers transition off of fossil fuel. Uh, because of the great uh, support from our customers in Burlington, uh, we're actually, uh, as you can see from the blue line, uh, going well above and beyond the uh, lower dotted line, which is the state requirement. And we're actually on track to, uh, to continue that progress over the next few years. That's what this proposal will support. Uh, so getting to the finances, as I mentioned, we had a rate case this past year. We've done uh, projections looking out, uh, and we actually had our, our A3 credit rating for Moody's was affirmed in August, which is good news uh, on our outstanding revenue bonds. Uh, what we're seeing right now is that with this revenue bond, we can reduce upward pressure on rates uh, compared to a scenario where we don't have it and we're still trying to fund all of these key projects, infrastructure investments and initiatives. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is upward pressure on rates, uh, about 4.9% with the revenue bond and without it, a really extraordinary number that we would never propose, uh, but a 23.7% of upward pressure that would exist without the revenue bond if we tried to do all of the things that we mentioned here and maintain the financial metrics that we have for Moody's. Um, how would we repay the revenue bond uh, in this case? It's, uh, it's really a couple of pieces. One of which is we have savings on our existing uh, revenue bond schedule that you can see here between 2025 and 2026, uh, where an existing credit, uh, existing revenue bond line will mature, and we'll have about 684,000 of annual capacity that can go towards repayment of this new net zero energy revenue bond. Um, and then, in addition, this this shows sort of the debt repayment schedule for the revenue bond. Uh, we can structure it in a way to take advantage of that. Uh, maturity that I just mentioned and have that be contributing to the principal repayment when it would begin in 2028. The other piece here is all of those different projects that we talked about, uh, heat pumps, uh, electric vehicles, electric bikes, electric lawnmowers, all of those different projects uh, are going to return some revenue uh, to the utility uh, that will also be used to help pay uh, for the bonding in this instance. Um, and in fact, we think that that may contribute up to 40% of the total debt service uh, for the revenue bond and the annual bonds that I mentioned. Uh, so between those two pieces, uh, we cover a significant portion of the debt service that would be required, and we're reducing upward pressure on rates uh, going forward for customers uh, relative to a scenario where we did not have the revenue bond available. Um, I think that was everything. I'm going to stop the screen share here back to you. Um, sorry to go through that very quickly, trying to keep you on schedule as much as I could. Um, but uh, myself or Emily would be glad to answer any questions if anyone has them. Thank you, Darren. I appreciate that. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing anyone. Thank you for... This is Matt oh, Matt has a question. question. Is there any way to estimate what Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, for an average residential customer, if we are pursuing the revenue bond and we're successful and we did have, uh, let's say, a 4.9% rate increase uh, as, as next year's rate increase, uh, that would be uh, around $3 or so uh, a month for a residential customer, uh, roughly. Um, we obviously are going to do a lot of work to try to avoid having that rate increase be at that level if we possibly can. Um, but that's, uh, that just gives you a sense of the, the kind of the scale. Um, I think with the 7.5% increase that we saw this year that was more significant, uh, folks were seeing in some cases uh, more like a $4.90 impact on a residential bill, and an average commercial customer was seeing about a $6.60 impact uh, for their bill for about two-thirds of our, res our commercial customers who are uh, in the small general service uh, category. Uh, so we're seeing, just to speak to that a little more, we're seeing declining uh, amounts of, of rate increases that will be needed over time. Uh, we're not seeing another 7.5% uh, that's going to be needed over the next five years. We think that rate pressure will moderate, and this revenue bond uh, is a strategy to help uh, with that. Thank you very much. I understand. Thanks, Darren. Are there other questions? Okay. 
So, uh, Darren and Emily, we're going to shift to our next topic. Thank you for coming and for all that information about the bond. Um, so, Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, Joan, we trust you're standing by to give us the City Council update and to tie up any loose ends from the policing panel that you may want to address. Um, from the policing panel, I just wanted to respond to Suzanne's last question, which was, you know, how do we, um, you know, in this in Ward Six and the South District, affect the the vote and actions at City Council? And honestly, I'm not sure how much um, councilors who don't represent you really weigh your opinions but i think that if you can talk to your friends who live in other districts and get them to be interacting with the counselors that represent them i think that that could certainly help and i do plan to bring forward um hopefully with broad support a, a resolution to increase the cap and it's my hope that we don't send that committee um as i think corey said you know uh what was it process paralysis or something I, I do think we need a lot of process around the cna report or at least you know with 150 recommendations there's a lot to go through not every item needs a lot of process but it does need to be reviewed um so we'll be working on moving that forward as well uh for city council, I want to keep this short because I think we have just reached our, our time limit for this meeting. I think there's probably two items of particular interest uh, towards six residents. One is that um, there was a proposal that came forward at our last meeting to eliminate parking requirements um, in residential districts. And uh, that is not something that I support, but um, it was favored and it's now in committee. And if people have opinions about that, I think it can be great if you want to do something and the thing getting in the way of what you want to do is a parking requirement. But um, when the landlord next door to you wants to do something and the thing saving you from you know, an increase of many units next door is actually a parking requirement, people see it differently. So there's certainly two sides to the coin. Um, and there's also really, I think, in terms of global warming, um, we want people to either get rid of their cars or go to um, you know, electric, clean vehicles, electric vehicles that BED is doing a great job of encouraging that. Um, but I don't see people rapidly giving up their cars in this city at this point. And I think we need to be realistic about that because we don't want people parking all over their green space, um, which happens a lot. <laughs> and then the other issue that came um, that we voted on, I think at our last meeting was a $40 million capital bond. On that one, I was actually the only no vote on a $40 million capital bond. And I don't think I've ever voted no on a capital bond before. I really support the city maintaining our infrastructure. And I think that's very important. And there were two reasons that I uh, didn't support this. One is that I think our top priority at this time really has to be the high school. And we don't have the numbers in from the high school. And I don't think it's fair to evaluate a $40 million bond um, ahead of the high school decision. I think our taxpayers should have that information. It, that is gonna be a lot more than $40 million. And I think after we, after we pass a bond for the school and we see what that is and what our needs are, then we should consider this bond. So it's not necessarily a lack of need, but in terms of even the need, we don't know at this point exactly what we're going to be getting for um, uh, funding, federal funding. We know some of what we're getting. We don't have it all nailed down as to what we're getting in federal funding for our capital projects and the way 
this um, resolution is written, it allows for transferring of the 40 million, 10 million is reserved for Memorial Auditorium. The 30 million is very fungible. So for example, there's, um, I think there's a total of 9.5 million planned for bike infrastructure. But if the council wanted to spend more than 9.5 million on bike infrastructure, and that's not just from the bond, to be clear, that's from other capital sources as well. But if the council decided they wanted to take from streets and add to bike infrastructure or take from any of the various buckets and add to another, they could do that the way this is written. So I don't think that people that, you know, we know, we don't really know exactly what this is going to um, pay for. There is a list of what's it, what's it, what it is expected to pay for but it also says that that can change um, you know by by council by a council decision okay so i guess you really good at that thank you joan that's helpful to know and folks can follow up with you if they need to know more so bring, thank you. bringing up the rear is our very patient max madolinski from Burlington Parks and Rec. And Max, why don't you go ahead and talk to us about the Champlain Pocket Park. And I apologize for the delay and I appreciate your standing by. Well, no, no problem. I actually, you made it right to my allotted time, right on time. So there you go, no wait on my end. Oh, hey. um, hi everyone, my name Take is it back. Uh, no, Max sorry. Madelinski. <laughs> <laughs> I work with uh, Burlington Parks and Recreation on the planning team there as a project coordinator. And uh, yes, I'm here today to talk to you about Champlain Street Park. So give me a second here. I've got a very brief presentation and then I'm just going to open it up uh, for discussion. All right. Can everybody see this? Yes. Yes. All right, so Champlain Street Park. So uh, this year we have some funding set aside for uh, performing some renovations of Champlain Street Pocket Park. Um, so just to do a quick overview, since a lot of times when I talk about this, people are like, where is that? Champlain Street Park. Uh, so up here on the top is a little bit of a map uh, that we've got. Uh, the top here is King Street, where my cursor is. Over here is Battery. On the bottom, we've got Maple Street, and there is uh, South Champlain Street, sort of cutting in between King and Maple. And right in the middle, tucked be between uh, a residential house here and a vacant lot on the south is Champlain Street Park. And on the bottom, you can kind of see a picture of it. Uh, there's not too much going on in the park right now. There's a little playground in there for sort of kids age two to five, what we would uh, typically call a tot lot. Um, some wooden benches, uh, a few crab apple trees, and a couple wooden garden beds that you can kind of see in the front here. Um, a lot of the amenities in the park are kind of coming to the end of their workable lifespan. Benches are uh, needing replacement, fencing needing replacement, and a lot of uh, vegetation kind of needs some work. So we had actually set aside some funding a year ago to tackle this, actually more than a year ago now. It was pre-pandemic. We were really ramping up on this project. Um, we had a number of events that we held, one at uh, King Street Youth Center that had pretty low attendance uh, and did not get as many of the kids from there as we would have liked. Uh, we held another event in the park, which was actually pretty well attended given that it was you know, anywhere from like 20 to 12 degrees outside in a day in February. And we had free hot chocolate, um, you know, a bunch of snow sculptures and stuff like that going on in the back, a little outdoor fire pit. And um, yeah, we set up a bunch of boards, which you can see here um, for people to sort of put sticker dots on different activities and sort of talk to us about what kinds of things they might want to see in the park. Um, and then the pandemic kind of rolled around and we had to shuffle all of our budgets and this project unfortunately got tabled until we are finally through the projects that got reprioritized and making it back to this one. Um, so starting this October, we are really just getting back to 
kind of where we started and really trying to do more outreach, trying to hear from more people about this park, uh, what kinds of things they might want to do in it, uh, any activities they're seeing in it now that they want to uh, either discourage or increase, um, putting us in touch with different community contacts and people who live in the neighborhood. Um, we do have an online survey that we posted and that is at this link here, which I'm happy to share with you, uh, either in the chat here or I can email it to the contacts at the NPA. And um, yeah, so that's really where we're at. And uh, I really today I'm here to hear your ideas, I ask you to help me spread the word about this project and what we're going to be doing and to get any questions and comments or thoughts you might have about the park. So thank you. And uh, here's this link again. I will send that over. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so we can just open it up to talk about the park. I have a comment question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for your presentation, Max. I actually learned about the Champlain Street Park for the first time last week. I didn't even know it existed until I walked by it. And I didn't connect it to this presentation that I knew was happening. So this is, I'm really happy to hear about this. To me, um, that park looked like something that time forgot. It, um, it's really easy to overlook it. It looks, yeah, like it really needs some attention and some care. And it seems to me, given its urban setting, that, and I know that there are multifamily homes surrounding it, that orienting it towards kids makes a lot of sense in my mind. And also just, just a facelift. Um, and somehow bringing attention to its existence. It's just so easy. I don't know how many times I've been up Champ Champlain Street and never noticed this until I actually walked by it. So um, I'm really glad that Parks and Rec is paying attention to it and it's certainly deserving of attention. Thank you so much for that feedback, Michelle. Yeah, we're really looking forward to giving this park a little bit of a facelift. It's definitely overdue. I know um, a lot of what is in there now was part of a community effort that involved a number of the neighbors who live on that block. But uh, yeah, I think people have moved out, moved on, that kind of thing. So. Hey, Max, this is Matt Gray. Other thoughts, comments? I was going to ask, does, oh, King, sorry. does King Street use it right now? Do they bring kids over there to, to do things? Because they have so many kids, of course. And I'm kind of surprised they're not interested. Yeah, they, they used to be one of our main contacts whenever we were thinking about this park and one of our main user groups there. Um, since they built their new youth center, and that includes its own playground. So now King Street Youth Center has a little playground right behind their building. They've told us that for the past like three to five years, they really have just stopped coming to the park. Um, and they, for a pretty long time, I, I'm relatively new here at Parks. I've been working here, it'll be five years in January. But what I've heard from um, our staff who have been on longer, they used to be our sort of main eyes on the park, yeah. looking after things, letting us know when things needed to be taken care of and that kind of thing. Okay. So yeah, now uh, what we hear from them is their main go-to is they go down to Perkins Pier when they need to. I see, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Max. Is there, are there any other comments about the Champlain Street Park? Meg. Hi, so our offices are nearby and um, we walk by it often and I know that there was some homeless encampment there so I know a lot of the people were concerned about it. That's the latest, um, but it's great to hear that there'll be more activity and we have lots of businesses in our building. Um, so we're happy to share and be a community member to help out. Awesome, which building are you based in? 65 Main Street, so Burlington Housing is in the same building as us right across from August 1st, where there's a lot of activity. So I think if you yeah. put up signs at August 1st, uh, half the city would see them. <laughs> oh, Great, thank you, Meg. Okay, so if no one else has a comment on the park, 
that winds up our agenda. For those of us who are still here, I want to say that to me this meeting brought out the best of NPAs and really the mission of our organizations, which is to connect residents directly with our elected leaders, with state or city employees, with other entities. And I was really grateful to hear directly from police officers, from our commissioner, and from our uh, city councilors. I think that was a really helpful um, discussion to allow our residents to have such a one-on-one -on -one with the folks who are responsible for ensuring our safety in the city. So thank you everyone who's here. And I didn't introduce Joel Fitzgerald, our other steering committee member earlier, but Yay. there he is. I can see his bouncing <laughs> screen. And um, yeah, thank you all for participating. And please come back next month. We'll continue this hybrid model. And we'll have another fascinating agenda for you next month. Thanks.